Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You should have seen me a few seconds ago. I had to cancel the video. <laughs> oh, it was really just... Hey, man. It was a mess. Uh, usually I'll... I'll let a little mess slide by when I'm looking a little raggedy, but it was really bad. <laughs> so, nah. Amen. Uh, today... Uh, I want to share, uh, try to share something. I don't know how good a job I'm going to do at this. I, I pray for the Lord's blessing upon this. <coughs> that perhaps through my reading of these, you know, I mentioned to you before that I got, uh, I get a weekly Torah reading. From what I understand, uh, the way they read the Torah through the year, year is uh, a certain section of it. They've got it divided up that they go through the entire Torah, evidently, every year. Um, and uh, bring forth a reading from it. Waiting for it to come up on a screen. Oh, Father God. Hopefully we'll have... You know, now we're going to have to go back to this. Things don't always work the first time for me. Sometimes I'll have to go back to it and uh, try to get back in again. What I'm trying to do is get back into my uh, email through the other search engine I have. And sometimes it'll go right into it and other times it won't. Just pray it does this time. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. So what I wanted to do was, like I said, I get these every week, and I go over them, and I meditate upon them, and I, uh, it's called the Messianic Bible, Shabbat Shalom, Ambrose, Verira, a covenant and, and inheritance is the Torah portion. So that's this, I believe that's this week's. Or a portion this week. Let me double check. Welcome to V A Y E R A, and he appeared. That's what that word translates into, and he appeared. This week's Parasha Torah portion. This is the portion of Torah that will be read in the synagogues around the world during the Shabbat, Saturday service. Please read along with us and enjoy. V-A-Y-E-R-A, V-A-Y-E-R-A, and he appeared. Genesis 18.1, 22 through 24. Second Kings 4.1 through 37. Luke 2. 1 through 38. The Lord appeared, Vayira, to Abraham near the great trees of Miram while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. In last week's Barisha, God sealed his covenant with Abraham, which promised the land to his descendants as an eternal heritage. Now, before we go too much further here, <clears throat> getting our minds off of the natural and into the eternal, I see the promised land as being the kingdom of heaven, not the natural kingdom of Israel. 
So when I read that particular scripture and I hear them mention the promise in last week's part Richard, God sealed his covenant with him which promised the land to his descendants as an eternal heritage. I see the kingdom of heaven as the land having been promised to us and that under the new covenant Abraham's covenant with God which the promised land to us is as an eternal heritage is what is being referred to in the literal writings here of which they as a type <laughs> okay are walking out the word of God in their journey all right of which we come into spiritually trying my best to um, angels <clears throat> this week's parash contains more angelic activity than any other parashat angels appear to Abraham as men bringing messages to him and Sarah of future events to come excuse me they also save Lot from a hostile mob lead Hagar to water for her son and comfort Hagar with the promise of Ishmael becoming a great nation later in the Parasha the angels also prevent Abraham from sacrificing his son Isaac again you can continue to look at what is being read as being relative to the natural realm but I don't when I read what is being said I relate it to the spiritual so Sarah and future events to come they also save Lot from a hostile mob, mob. This, this part about lead Hagar, Hagar to water for her son now you know I have referred to Hagar in the natural or spiritually speaking as being the bondwoman and Ishmael being her son the bondwoman and her son of whom the word says must be cast out okay relative to what took place in the natural realm between Sarah having Hagar and her son cast out okay I believe the same as a spiritual truth relative to the natural realm the cardinal mind okay so in that sense when I read that God led now you gotta remember this is God okay God led Hagar to water for her son and comfort Hagar with the promise of Ishmael becoming a great nation so when I see that and hear that I think immediately of the natural man who has become a great nation of course then we could relate that to what the Gentile okay and the light of the Word of God that came forth all right to man the natural man being Ishmael all right or the cardinal mind as I've mentioned before the bond woman all right who became a great nation so and in the natural of course we're talking about uh, Islam but spiritually speaking there's something else there and this is what I'm trying to help to share with you as I read this my insight and understanding to what the literal word is manifesting itself in the spiritual so that even and I do believe this uh, with the blood moons and the festivals related to Israel right down to the very word that is being read and spoken on this weekly Torah 
I believe there is an immediate connection to what the Holy Spirit would have be unveiled to us from the literal writings that will be food to us right here, right now, in each and every week portion of the Torah. But we have to come to learn to understand spiritually what these things mean when we read them literally. <clears throat> this week's brush is, is entitled Vayira, which means appeared. It is also called that it is also called that because Abraham receives in Hebron plains of Marum, Merim, three mysterious guests. These are the angels. It seems that God is visiting Abraham while he is convalescing from his Brit Mala or circumcision, which had occurred three days prior. Despite his comfort, Abraham graciously attends to his guests. Now, we're being showed right now the circumcision of the flesh, all right, that occurred three days prior prior to these angels appearing. Abraham in welcoming the three men is demonstrating more than just good manners. This attitude of open hospitality has saved many a nomad's life in harsh desert climate. In fact, this custom of welcoming the stranger or some of these words are very hard for me to pronounce so I ask you to bear with me. Hash Asadat Oshim, Oshim is one of two Jewish mitzvah commandments still in existence today that originated in God's visit to Abraham during this parasha. The other is Bakur Choyim, or visiting the sick, welcoming the stranger, Hash Shanat Oshim, and visiting the sick, Bakur Kohim, Kohim. Something like that. We can be sure that God sees when we are ill and he is present to comfort and minister to us. Furthermore, angels are still active today to protect, save, help, and warn and encourage us. Amen. Now, angels to me are messengers and when it says to the angels of the churches of God, I believe they're talking to of perhaps even the prophets, uh, the gift of prophecy in the church as the messengers who are considered to be angels, messengers of God in the church. I mean, you got to remember, he's addressing this to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, okay, <laughs> to the angels of the seven churches, okay. So, now you can have, amen, Jesus, praise God, uh, angels, a particular a specific angel, and or it could be a wisdom of one of the seven wisdoms, or they can be seen as, because you see this whole birthing process of what God gives birth to, okay, in, in the spirit realm is, okay, being shown to us in the natural, literal writings, of which we come to understand beneath the surface of what's been written. So <laughs> these things are being revealed to us if we're well, if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. So obviously, I'm trying to I'm trying to explain to you that the eight, the angels of those churches were the messengers, and I believe if he's addressing this in the Book of Revelations to them, then he is addressing it to literal people and what literal person in the church with the gifts that were given to the church would be a messenger of God but those who had the gift of prophecy so that's my that's what I see when he makes reference so angels can be angelic beings they can also be messengers of God in the natural, in the gifts uh, of prophecy. 
Okay, Abraham in welcoming the three men. Okay, ba 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 ba. ba. Uh, we can be assured that God sees. Okay, an active group protect. Sorry for going over that. Angels of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and rescues them. Psalms 34 7. The Brit Malah is Judaism's oldest ritual and only mitzvah commandment that was carried out communally by the Israelites before entering the promised land. Now remember, this was before entering the promised land. And what is the promised land? Kingdom of heaven. That's my understanding of it. In fact, God commanded Joshua to take flint knives in order to circumcise their son because this covenant had not been exercised during the desert wandering. Now, <laughs> uh, so what's this saying? Well, it's saying that Israel, as a type, wandered around the desert for that 40 years, which I believe 40 represents completion, you know, the furrowing of their hearts, whatever. And it's only just before they enter into the promised land, okay, that they're circumcised. Now, you know and I know that the Word has told us that the circumcision that takes place through the power of the Holy Spirit is of our hearts, not the foreskin of our, you know, you know what. But, amen, Jesus, that was the natural, okay, uh, evidence of a covenant between uh, Israel, Abraham, and his children in the natural, and God. So, that was the covenant sign, the circumcision. Okay. Then Joshua circumcises their sons, whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not been circumcised on the way. Oh. So, so you, you see what I'm seeing here? Are you, are you hearing this? It's possible to be in the way, to be being walking in the way, and not have received the circumcision. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And I want you to look at Egypt as being the world. Rolled the reproach of Egypt away from us, you. The Talmud, Jewish oral law, considers the malah from the verb la mul, meaning to circumcise, to be equal to all the other 612 commands. This is interesting. We can see this in Jewish gematria. Since Hebrew letters are also numbers, the Hebrew word brit, meaning covenant, has a numerical value of 612. In parentheses, they write bet, equals to Reish equals 200 Yud equals 10 and Tav equals 400 so when Brett 612 is combined with the singular commandment of Malah circumcised in Brett Malah it equals 613 in other words the full number of commandments in the Torah and what does the word say regarding the circumcision of our hearts, the writing of God's laws upon our hearts, okay, and the fulfilling of the whole law in obedience to the first two and most important commandments, that we will be fulfilling it. So this is, this is what the circumcision of the heart does spiritually, which in the natural did in the circumcision of the flesh. It completed all of the commandments. Okay. In our obedience to loving God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and love our brother as we do yourself. And you don't love, if you don't love your brother as you, as you do yourself, I mean, you're not made one with your brother, then you cannot love God. End of story. So, and we mentioned that the other day in a, another video. While anyone, anyone can be circumcised simply for health reasons, when a Jewish person fulfills this commandment in order to be in covenant with God, 
It elevates the circumcision as an act of holiness. The Brit Malat represents our bond with Adonai. For this reason, it is considered by some people as something uniquely Jewish. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants in ancient times. Gentiles were therefore referred to as uncircumcised ones. For instance, when David referred to the giant Goliath, he called him an uncircumcised Philistine. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 1 Samuel 17.26 What difference would it make to David and Israel whether or not Goliath's foreskin was still intact or not? David was not announcing the state of Goliath's physical condition. Rather, he was emphasizing the fact that this giant was not in holy covenant with God, with the God of Israel. In other words, David proclaimed a statement of faith that God would uphold the covenant and protect Israel. It might have been challenging not to look on the strength and powers of his enemy, but David overcame and instead looked to the strength and faithfulness of the God of Israel. Although the commandment to the Jewish people to circumcise their sons on the eighth day, now this is the eighth day, still holds true. What, what, what did we talk about eight representing? What have we said? And, we, and, and it, on the eighth day, it's new beginning. The first six days past, day of rest. The following day is the eighth day, which is what? The beginning of a new cycle. New week newness and some resurrection. So um, eighth day still holds true. The Torah tells us that God will circumcise our hearts and those of our descendants to love and obey him when we come back into the land. Now you see that that okay I catch that and see that as a contradiction because what the word said was before they entered into the land their hearts were circumcised. Okay, and now he wants to say, okay, turn it around a little bit, <laughs> okay, uh, so that uh, it says that uh, <clears throat> although uh, what's, he, what's he say here? Although the commandment to the Jewish people to circumcise their sons on the eighth day still holds true, the Torah tells us that God will circumcise our hearts and those of our descendants to love and obey Him when we come back into the land. Well, I'm going to have to look at that. Let's see if there's some verse. There may be. Because that's not what it says. It said they circumcised them before they entered into the land with Joshua. But now this may be something different. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Now you see it does not say before you enter into the land or after you enter into the land. Which is why he just made that statement. So you have to be very careful. I don't care who it is that's sharing whatever they're sharing with you. Listen very intently to everything they're saying because it's those kind of things that cause us to get crossed up. you got to watch and pay attention very closely to everything that's being said. <clears throat> All right. Deuteronomy 36. The ancient Hebrew prophet Jeremiah also called the Jewish people to circumcision, circumcise their hearts. Now here we go. This is, we've talked about this before. We're not all of those who are under the law. Okay. We're not also circumcised of their hearts. Just like with in the faith, the so-called faith. Well, the faith versus a faith, okay, of a particular brand. You know what I'm saying? The so-called Christian faith versus the few. Okay, the, the same truth was there with Israel way back when because although the vast majority were called to be under the law, only a few had their hearts circumcised to God. Okay? The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts. Okay. Circumcision. Circumcise yourself. This is an ancient Hebrew prophet Jeremiah also called the Jewish people to circumcise their hearts. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my wrath go forth like fire 
and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. The issue of circumcision extends far beyond the physical and becomes a crucial matter of the heart. The circumcision of the heart is not done with human hands, but is only accomplished by the faithful working of the Rok HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, in the lives of those who follow Yeshua. Amen. Amen. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Messiah. Colossians 2.11 In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Messiah. Colossians 2.11 For the sake of ten, now I checked this out and my book, my Bible reads a little bit differently than what they're offering right here, but I'll reread it. I remember reading this the other day because I get it on Friday. Today obviously is uh, sunset Friday, sunset Saturday, that 24 hour per is what they celebrate as the day of rest. And we've talked about all those issues right now in regarding to what the Gentile was given uh, as directions to what he should or should not do regarding things strangled and so on and so forth, staying away from fornication, and then we're, we know we're warned about excessive dissipation, which many want to say, well, you can't drink. That's not what the Word says. The Word says not to be of excessive, of much, of excessive dissipation. Didn't that say you could not become dissipated? It's, it's a warning against becoming alcoholic or a drunkard, okay, for obvious reasons because it's, if you've ever tried to talk or reason with somebody who's drunk, you'll find that it's totally next to impossible. Well, the same is true of the Holy Spirit being able to lead us and guide us. I mean, so we're to be remain sober-minded. Anyway, nonetheless, okay, there were certain things passed on to us that were not uh, laws, but principles by which we were to live as uh, believers. And uh, then, of course, all right, uh, we're led by the commandments of God as that tutor, okay? And the laws, there are tutor, they tutor us. Until when? Until Christ be formed in you. So, I mean, it brought us to Christ. So our obedience and submission is from our hearts from that point on, and we depend totally and completely upon the leading of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Word of God, and the teachings of Okay, that we've received to guide us and lead us into all righteousness. So uh, you've got to cut loose of any thoughts of works of which you yourself uh, believe that you have to do this or do that. Touch this, don't touch that. Taste this, don't taste that. It, you, you, the second you get back into the natural realm, you've defiled the uh, Spirit of God. And... Uh, it doesn't work. You trust God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you serve Him in spirit, soul, and body, and uh, that's where it ends. End of line. End of the line. Don't continue in sin. It's quite obvious. All right. These some of these things people seem to want to continue to bring up to people. It says, it, you know, they want to treat you like you're a moron. <laughs> okay. We get the point that we're not supposed to continue in sin. We have weaknesses and infirmities. There are things of which His grace is sufficient. Love covers a, a multitude of sin, but it doesn't mean that we're supposed to continue to be sinners or disobedient to the leading of the Spirit of God. We get that, okay? So, But there are some self-righteous people out here that just want to grind that into the ground as if they're something that they think they are, but they're really not. They're, you know, stench to the nostrils of, of God's nostrils. Holier than thou, okay? Don't listen to them. 
I haven't got the foggiest idea what they're even talking about. Okay, in pleading for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, well, that's interesting. In, in this parasha, Abraham learns of God's intention to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've talked about this, and because of their sin. In the pleading of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham, whose name means father of the multitude. Now you see, <coughs> this guy is going to go ahead and explain to you that, uh, that Abraham is pleading for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> okay. I don't believe that. In pleading for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, why would Abraham, a godly man, plead for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who are off into this awful, terrible lust of the flesh? I know we're supposed to pray for our enemies, but I don't see him, okay, pleading for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. What I see him doing is inquiring of the Father through these angels for the sake of saving Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what I see. Okay. But nonetheless, amen. Okay. Whose name means father of the multitude of nations. Yeah, Abraham's name means father of a multitude of nations. Lives up to his name by acting as a father. This is how they relate uh, this idea that he was pleading for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah is that because his name which means uh, father of a multitude of nations lives up to his name by acting as a father who pities his children. Oh yeah? Uh, he asked God if his judgment would stay, would be stayed if we would, st if we would not destroy, okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, if he found 50 righteous men there. Okay, well, and I've explained to you what I saw there was 50 was, okay, the number used for Jubilee, and I believe it's that setting free, okay, every 50 years there's a Jubilee of which there's a year rest, I believe it is, for all of the land, and so on and so forth, or is that once every seven years? But anyway, 50, look up the word 50, or the number 50. When you read something about uh, God talking to Abraham, or Abraham talking to God, and Abraham mentions something like 50 righteous. Look at that. It's more than just a number. It's more than just what the conversation is about. If there were, okay, and he goes on to say 40, but actually the word I read said five less. If there were five less than 50, that would be 45, okay? And that's what the King James Version that I'm, I've got said. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and then uh, on to 40, 30, then 20, and finally 10. God promises that for the sake of 10 righteous, he will not destroy. And again, check out the number 10. Okay. Uh, we have five wise versions and five foolish. Is it just by chance that that number adds up to 10? I don't think so. Is there a, a, a correlation between Sodom and Gomorrah and the call to repentance of which we come out? Okay in this end time, uh, and the whore harlot church, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, is there a connection to these things? And are, it, uh, are what we're seeing here real, really something more than that, but as a type of that which is about to take place in the saving of these cities? Okay, we've, we've talked about this, about Nineveh and Jonah. Ten is an important number corresponding to the tenth Hebrew letter, Hude, which was originally produced yod, meaning arm and hand. So, you know, I've, I've mentioned you, divine order. <laughs> and what, here it is, the Hebrew word uh, or meaning of ten. Ten is an important number corresponding to the tenth Hebrew letter, yod, which was originally pronounced yod, meaning arm and hand. Okay, divine order, arm and hand, power and authority. So <clears throat> we can understand that in Hebrew the number 10 is a reference to the hand of God or arm of the Lord which represents salvation. All right. I, are you getting what I'm saying yet? Okay. Even in their uh, this um, Torah reading that I get, there's an attempt to help the... Trent, uh, Moses sent out 12 spies. 
out of the land of Israel. And ten came back with an evil report. In the wilderness, the children of Israel tested God ten times. Jacob's wages were changed ten times by Lebanon. Daniel and his friends were tested ten days in Babylon. You see, uh, there's a list of these things which go beneath the surface of the literal reading. And if all you're doing is reading a good moral story or some dull, boring history okay, of people that lived three, four thousand years ago, then you're going to fall asleep in the middle of reading it. But if you're starting to read what is beneath the surface of the Word of God and starting by the grace of God, what is it that... They ask that we pray that the Lord might uh, uh, bless us, okay, with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Revelation knowledge. Revealing, understanding, seeing the things hidden beneath the surface. Pray that you receive the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Praise God. So I don't want to spend a lot more time on this. There are some mentions about the tithing and all that took place with that. And if you guys are interested in receiving this um, yourselves, and along with this I get the Berean daily scriptures. Gives me something to keep my mind on the Lord each and every day. You know, I go through my laptop, I... You know, I I read these things, and I have that scripture for that day, I read it, and and then once a week I've got the Torah, the Old Testament coming to me, so, you know, stay stirred up in these things. Don't, yeah. Oh my God, do not stop now. Keep going. Keep going. All right. So anyway, um... I'm trying to find uh, if there's something. Okay, Masonic Bible, N E W News at Bible uh, for Israel dot com. Bibles for Israel. That's Bibles for Israel. Um, I'm trying to figure out just exactly how I end up getting this sent to me. Uh, all it says on the title of my, um, for those that might be interested in it, because um, I get a lot out of it. Okay, it just has Masonic, Messianic Bible. That's all it has. Shabbat Shalom. Um, so, try to track it down. And if I find some other way of tracking it down for you, I'll, I'll let you know about it. But if I found it, you can find it. So, okay, well, amen, Jesus, thank you, Father. I'm going to get out of this page and get back to you guys. 38 minutes, not bad. Uh, Might have been a little dry today, a little boring. But it won't be (laughs) once you actually start to pick up on these things that are written there for us to see, okay? And this is what I believe is what is understood to be the revealed word of the Father. Okay? Different than that which is the literal writing and or those things of which we receive in the meat of the word of God. This is different than that. I've tried to illustrate that to you that what Jesus was saying relative to him as, as a son, as the only begotten son of God, and what he heard and saw okay, didn't come from him. It came from the Father. The Father gave it to him. I say nothing, I hear not the Father saying. So the Father was speaking to him. And he says, I do nothing, I see not the Father doing. So he's making reference to the eyes, the eyes and the ears. Okay. (laughs) Which I've shared with you, I believe, is a double portion, which was about to come upon the body. The early and latter rain in the same month. Along with that comes the awakening of which I did want to share but I'm not going to right now because it took so long to get through this. Uh, different aspects of that awakening regarding the virgins and what we've mentioned about the dead in Christ and those who are asleep. Okay, 
Because it seems to me as though the Word of God is indicating to us that there are people in and among the church at this hour, both of the wise and the foolish, who are asleep. Okay? And as I have mentioned to you before, I believe that they are making reference to the outer court ministry, to the 30-fold who have yet to have been awakened spiritually, that they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when he says there's a commotion in the marketplace, in and among these households of faith, I believe it's the promised baptism of the Holy Spirit coming upon them very soon now. And that that's what creates the commotion in the marketplace, which is the awakening spiritually of the truth. They receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and enter into the inner court. So, and then we've got a whole deal with the fish. You know, I, I tried to share with you before the difference between the separating of the wheat and the tares and the casting out of the net to draw in the fish, of which he then separates the good fish from the bad fish. Don't see the fish as being the wheat and the tares. See the fish as, as those who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, Lord, have we not cast out uh, demons in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? These are indications of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, folks. Okay? Just as I've shared with you, there were bad priests who were in the inner court who followed after the people. Okay? Get the bucks. <laughs> All right? And then there were the sons of Zadok in the priest, in, in and among the priesthood, who were faithful unto God. The good fish and the bad fish. So, I love you guys. The Lord be with you and bless you in your shoes. Amen.